What is the real cost to being a Christian and to following Yeshua? This is part two of a series on discipleship. If you missed it, then make sure you check out part one, which I'll show you in just a second. But in this lesson, we want to answer a few questions, which is what is the cost of following Yeshua? Is there a cost to following Yeshua? This is very important. This lesson came about because if you look around in the Christian dome in general and, and those who proclaim to follow him and to be Christians or disciples or redeemed or saved, there's a lot of mis misinformation out there. There's a lot of misunderstanding. And I felt the need to come back to the scriptures and see what does it say? Because left alone, we come up with our own ways. So we want to answer, what's the cost of following Yeshua? What does he actually say? What does the scripture say? Then what is the role disruption play in discipleship? One of the last things we can stand is being disrupted or interrupted. Is there a place for interruption and disruption if you want to follow Yeshua? If you want to follow God, if you want to be a Christian, and you're going to hear me say these synonymously all the time, but I want to make sure I'm connecting with you and how you see your walk and whatever labels you use. When called to follow Yeshua, what should be our response from a biblical perspective? Look, as I mentioned, we, this is a second part to a three-part series. The first part we looked at last time about the cut. Who cannot be a Christian biblically? Look, this is all. This channel is all about coming back to the Word of God, teaching us to learn, to love, and to live in His Word, according to His Word. And if this is something that gets you excited, something that you know you need, you, you're convicted, you're encouraged, you're inspired, make sure you click the subscribe button, share it with a friend, like the post so that you can continue to get these videos as soon as they drop every week. In last week's study, we looked at five types of people who cannot be a Christian according to the Word of God, according to Yeshua's own words. Those who love close relationships, those who love their life more than Yeshua, those who refuse to deny themselves, those who refuse to take up their cross daily, and those who refuse to follow Yeshua. If you want to see more about each part of each one of those, I really dig into it over an hour and a half. Of, of sharing in scripture who cannot be a Christian. So there is no deceiving. There is no weeping and gnashing of teeth unnecessarily because you've been told. We've all know this and we cannot get comfortable in thinking that I do these things and it makes me feel better. But what does he actually say? The last part in this series would be the call, which we look at as a disciple. What does it look like now? What should be expected of us if we are following Yeshua? But I want to go ahead and jump into this lesson, which is about the cost. How much will it cost me to follow Yeshua? Is there any cost at all? Again, this is extremely important because some believe there's varying, there's varying answers to this question about cost. Some believe nothing. Some believe a little bit. Some believe something. Some believe more. Some believe most. But what's the real answer in Scripture about what does it cost? Let's look at that first response. It costs me nothing to follow Yeshua. Now I've heard this claim in different ways and it sounds something like he's paid the price, he's done all the work and I don't have to do anything short of praying a prayer into my heart or believing what he's done for me and that's so far from the truth. Matter of fact, we see this sentiment even in David as he attempts to build an altar for Yahweh. Let's look at that story. First Chronicles 21, 22, it says, David said to Ariuna, let me have the site of your threshing floor so I can build an altar to Yahweh that the plague on the people may be stopped. Sell it to me at the full price. Now, David wanted to build an altar to Yahweh, but he demanded that I'm going to pay for this at full price. There's no way. I'm going to build an altar to Yahweh and try to get a bargain and discount for it, he says. Why? He understands the principle. This man after God's own heart understands the importance of paying that full price. He goes on to say, Ariana said to David, take it. Let my Lord, the king, do whatever pleases him. Look, I will give the oxen for the burnt offerings, the threshing sledges for the wood and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give all this. And Ariana was like, look, I give all this stuff to you. Just take it. You're doing some great work here. And what does David reply? He says, but the king replied to Ariana, no, I insist on paying the full price. I will not take for Yahweh what is yours or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. There's no way I'm going to do that. Give something to Yahweh that costs me nothing. Can you imagine doing that? You're looking for the best bargain. You're looking for the cheapest price. You're looking for the least path of the path of least resistance. And then you're going to offer that. No, it has to cost something. Surely, 
He says, there's no way that I'm going to take this for free. So we start to see this question being answered. How much is it going to cost me? It costs me nothing. No, it can't be nothing. And while this is not looking at Yeshua, we're going to move into that. We're going to get our answer. And I think we kind of get a sense of what that is already if you've been around the scripture. But I want to tease out each one of these levels because sometimes we actually think that, especially those of us who've been around the faith a while, right? And we think, okay, I'm in, I'm good. I'm already in to become a Christian. He paid the price and I don't really have to do much else. Even I can live in sin. I can um, make mistakes here and there. It don't cost me anything. It's easy. He says, no, 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 there's a big cost. And I want to make sure, again, in this lesson and on this channel, that we dig deep enough into the scriptures to show the, the true cost of what it means to follow him. And some are saying something is better than nothing. That I know that's been my mindset a lot of times. Hey, something's better than nothing. But we go back to Genesis and see that that can't be true because Cain and Abel showed us that. In the course of time, Cain brought to Yahweh an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the fat portions. And Yahweh had great had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. What do we see here? They both brought something. It's not like Cain decided, I'm not going to do anything. Right? How much does it cost to follow Yeshua? How much does it cost to be a, a believer in God and to, um, to to call yourself one of his? What he says, Yahweh came down and said, this isn't right. Something's not. I, 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 I chose Abel over Cain, even though they both both brought something. So something isn't enough. See, and if we look at the wording here, it says he brought an offering of the fruit. And then we see Abel bringing the firstborn of his flock. And for whatever reason, Yahweh looked at that and says, this is favorable. Now we know from looking at scripture, Yahweh prefers the first, prefers the first fruits, the firstborn. And there's blood in, um, involved here. So there's a lot of things here, but we don't get a lot of answers as to the details around why one was favored. But it's likely around that. But the point I want to make here is bringing simply something is not enough. What does that mean for us in 21st century? Well, I showed up to church every single week. Well, I read my Bible. I prayed. I did this thing. I volunteered. I gave. I did something. Something is not enough. When we can't become complacent and comfortable thinking that I'm doing something. Um, even in Malachi, they were doing something. They were bringing some offering. It says, but you say what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says Yahweh. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick. Hey, but you know what? We brought something. You know what I'm saying? We didn't have to bring anything, but we brought some. That's a good thing, right? He says, no, it's been taken by violence. It's lame. It's sick. And this you bring as your offering. You bringing this as your offering. No, this is not good enough that you brought this. Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it and yet sacrifices to Yahweh what is blemished. He says, cursed are you? You call it names now? Cursed is the one you actually have something that was worth value and would be acceptable, but you held it back and gave something of lesser value. So we now see that nothing is not okay. Simply bringing something is not okay. This something needed to be of great value or it turns up the nostrils of Yahweh and says, you got to be kidding me. Later on, he talks about, would you even bring this to your governor? Would you even bring this to your boss or your manager? And you're offering me this. Sometimes we give God oftentimes the scraps off our table. We talk about how we don't have time, not time to pray, no time to read, no time to walk out the faith that we claim to embrace. We just want the label of I'm a Christian, I'm a disciple, I'm a follower, but I'm struggling to make time. He says, give me the best. Give me the first fruits. One good practical is start your first of your day, the best and sweetest part of that morning with Yahweh instead of rushing to do the other things that of your pleasure, that's fun or your work. He says, no, no, no. Let the fun be. Let your delight be in him, in his word. 
let that be first. Not just saying oh, I'll I'll snack on some scriptures. I'll look read the scripture for the day, whatever it is. He wants what's best, and he wants that to be first. For I'm a great king, says Yahweh of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. I'm a great king, and my name will be feared. So what is the cost? Well, it's more than nothing, and it's more than something. We can't just simply say, I'm bringing something, and that'd be okay. In Luke, we find that it's more that simply saying more is not enough, right? I gave more than I did last time. I gave more, especially than this other guy did. Oh, we can do that so often. We don't say it out loud sometimes, but sometimes we do. Here's a story that reminds me of that scenario. It says to some who were confident in what? Their own righteousness. See, their confidence was coming from their own righteousness. And they looked down on everyone else. You don't think he sees that in our hearts? You may have found ways to cover it up, but he says, I see it in your heart. You're looking down on everyone else because you're dressed so nicely and you haven't done this and you haven't done that. You haven't delved into this sin and that sin. And you look at those of the world or even less faithful believers. Well, I'm better than them. He told him this parable. He says two men went up to the temple to pray one a pharisee and the other a tax collector the pharisee stood by himself and prayed god i thank you that i'm not like other people what a prayer and it kind of seems like a nice prayer like i'm I'm glad i'm not like them right I, I, maybe you bless me you've given me so much i'm glad i'm not like them he says these these robbers and evildoers these adulterers oh my gosh you know in a world like ours today it's easy to do that because there's so much craziness going on, so much filth and so much debauchery that we can easily say doing better than that, especially to those who are professing to be followers. I'm doing better than them. Or even like this, this tax collector, I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Oh, boy. Sometimes we can say that in our hearts. Man, I'm devoting myself so much. I get up early. I read. I do these things. We can put forth all the things that we're doing. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humble, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. We must be careful that in thinking that discipleship and deciding to follow Yeshua or continuing our walk in following him is going to look like, well, I'm doing more. You know, we take a lot of pride in doing more. We love to be in groups of people like us where we can look at other groups and say we're better than them. We're better than that church. We're better than that denomination. We're better than that group. We're better than that country. Look at us. And there's a subtle undertone sometimes of look at us. We're better. But I'm here to tell you that this true discipleship, being a Christian, following Yeshua, is not going to come by doing more than, more than someone else. Because he's created the standard for us to follow. He says, I'm the standard. I've made it clear in the word. Doing more is not enough. And lastly, doing most, right? i given you most is not enough. So one of the stories uh, in Acts 5 is of that there's a, a couple who sold a property and it looks like they gave most of what they promised now a man named ananias together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of prop property with his wife's full knowledge he kept back part of the money for himself he but brought the rest and put it at the apostles feet then peter said ananias how is it that satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the holy spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land then it belonged to you before it was sold. And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied. You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. And he lost his life in that moment. You see, he decided somewhere along the way, after deciding I'm going to give all this to God, that we could keep a little bit of it. I don't know how much it was, but I doubt it was more than half. It was probably a small piece. A piece of property is 
I'm sure worth a good amount of money. But they kept, it says, part. But you're going to keep part. And I'm going to give the rest to God. Think about that. This is this is how I'm going to follow Yeshua. I'm going to give part. I know I promised all. I know he demanded and called for all, which we're going to talk about. But I'm going to give part to him. I'm going to give part to myself and I'm going to give whatever's left to him. Have you ever been guilty of that? I'm going to give the best of my years. You know, a lot of young people are going through life with that mentality saying, I'm going to get the best of my years to sowing wild oats and seeds and doing all the things and filling my flesh with all the things and pleasures of this world. And then at some point I'll be like grandma, grandpa and settle down and such and such. And I always have a message for those who have such a thinking. Please listen. God cannot be mocked. You cannot and will never mock God. To have such an attitude of pride and arrogance, to think that you will be able to come back and be granted repentance, be granted life in order to do that. So much pride there. James 5 talks about it when he says those who say, I'm going to carry on in this way, carry on business. And then later I'm going to do this or that. He says, no, the good you ought to do right now that you know about, you should be doing. Otherwise, it's sin. Later on, I'm going to do this. No, 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 no. Or sometimes we can give part by saying, I'm going to give the best of my energy, of my youth, of my talents to this job, to my pursuit of my career, to my pursuit of my major if I'm in school. I'm going to give the best of all this and I'm going to keep God on the side and make sure because that's important. You know, we see it on TV a lot of times with celebrities. They're prostituting themselves in Hollywood, giving themselves away, acting in all kinds of ways on the TV screen in the name of a profession, in the name of acting. And then says, all praise be to God. All praise isn't to God, for they have decided I'm going to give you what's left. Many have used their talents of singing, the talents of drawing, the talents of all types and given it to the world and brought the rest and put it at God's feet. What a lie. He said, this is not this. This is not going to work. If you're going to follow me, it's going to cost you not just some. It's definitely not going to cost nothing and not just most and not just more. As you already know, it's going to cost everything you have. You cannot keep some for yourself. They kept it for themselves. No, it takes all. So how much will it cost? Um, How much will following Yeshua really cost me? As I've already alluded to, and you may already know. Luke 14, 33 says, those of you who do not give up everything, you have everything you have cannot be my disciples. And, you know, from my last study, this word disciple, the same thing as Christian. The Christians were called disciples first. And disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. We said out in Acts. This is the same one. Do not be deceived in thinking that you can go throughout this life, giving God most, giving God more, more than giving God some. Well, I'm doing more than my family. I'm doing more than I've ever done. I'm giving some. He says, no, it requires absolute everything. I know we're looking at people who we uh, admire and look up to spiritually and thinking, well, look at these guys. They give a lot. They give most. And we're trying to emulate them. Don't do that. Look to the master, Yeshua, for even they run afoul of his standard. Many of them are very well spoken, well dressed. And, and carry themselves in very pious manners. But all is all. And we see that, and we'll continue to see that as we go through this study. The question is, did you count the cost? So now we hear, we start to hear this call for all. Did you count that cost? I'm convinced that many who are professing to be believers and followers of Yeshua since they were kids or in had some conversion at some point, I'm, I'm convinced that it's likely that many have not counted the cost of what it actually means. And that's a necessary component before you make a decision of giving up your whole life. You know, something like when you start a job, you count the cost. 
the travel? How much are they paying? When you get married, it's your whole life. Okay, who is this? What is this going to mean? What's the cost? How much more, more than any of those, will we need to count the cost to following him? And he makes that clear. This is another reason why, unlike most or like many believe, children are not able to follow Yeshua because they are unable to count the cost. First, you need to know what the cost is. That was part one of our lesson in Luke 14, verse 20, I believe. And he goes down a list. He says, unless you do these things, you cannot be minus. It's a cost. And you have to count those now. So this is a extremely important step that we must consider. When addressing that same, those same crowd, that same crowd we talked about last time, he continues and make sure that they understand that this cost must be counted. We're going to pick up there here in this next slide. In verse 28, it says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost? He says, won't that make sense? If you is still talking about the what it means to follow him, he says, for a tower, won't you first sit down? You're not going to just start building stuff. You're going to first sit down and estimate the cost to see what? If you have enough money to complete it. For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Now, he's not talking about how to be an architect or a general contractor who's building buildings. No, 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 no. He's saying this in the same way you must count the cost to following him. If we back up and look at that context, we see that. And as we close out, we'll see that. You must first sit down and count the cost. Many have not finished the walk in the faith because they didn't count the cost. See, there's a cost. Yes, there's some benefits. There's some amazing benefits in this life and definitely in the life to come. But we want to dismiss the cost. And the cost has a price tag hanging off of it with three letters that says all. A-L-L. Everything. Everything you got. I didn't see that cost. And that includes some of the most painful times, suffering, disappointments. You're going to miss out on things that you feel entitled to or friends or others around you may have access to and you don't get. It's a cost. And he and I love that Yeshua doesn't hide this from us. He tells us up front, here's what it's going to cost. Look at my life. But first, sit down and count the cost. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider? You see those words again. Stop and think. Hold on. Stop and think. Stop getting emotionally caught up in the moment where the altar call has come. Or you see something on um, social media. Or you have an experience. He says, no. It's, exci- it's okay to be excited and be emotionally moved. But we have to tap into our logic and say, let me count the cost and think about this here. Am I really ready to do it? Because if you're not thinking it through, you won't finish it because there are some challenges and some um, valleys that come with this as well. Consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose uh, the one coming against him with 20,000. If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. Again, he's not talking about kings here. I wonder if he's trying to explain to us that we're like that army with 10,000. And the long way off, we have an army that's double the size. And we're thinking to ourselves, hmm, I don't think I can win this battle. While that army is still a long way off, I need to go make terms of peace. I wonder if he's suggesting that while the kingdom may be a long way off and coming before Yeshua, maybe, maybe not. It may be a good idea to make terms of peace because there ain't no way you're going to win against God's army. You're just not going to win. And this 10, this, this, this one to two ratio is far off, as we know. It only took two angels to destroy two whole cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. It, it's not, it's not even worth considering. It's the, the comparison is far off. You're not going to win. Surrender. So he's asking that we consider, sit down and consider what the costs are. Think about this. Whether you've made a decision to follow him before and you didn't do this or you did. Or whether you've been in a walk for a while, it's important that we stop and pause and consider. Is this something that I'm doing and want to continue to do is to go all in and and at the cost of everything? Because here's the part that really hits us between the eyes. 
In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. He says in the same way, this is what I've been trying to describe to you. Everything you have, you cannot follow me. Everything. Yes, that thing, too. It's the thing that you most closely hold dear to you. It could be a relationship. It could be an idea. It could be a pursuit of a career or a way of life that you felt entitled to because you've been indoctrinated with feeling entitled to that because you grew up in America that talks about the pursuit of happiness. I'm guaranteed that I need to be able to sit not in the kingdom. See, we're so far removed from kingdom mentality because we've never been under a king. In a kingdom, the king has complete authority and rule, and we're simply servants to do his bidding. We don't have the rights that you have in a democracy where the people rule and say, well, I don't like this. And well, we can have both. You do your thing and I'll do my thing. And for the most part, I'll come to. No, no, no. It's complete and utter surrender. Your land is not your land. It's the king's. Your money, not yours. It's the king's. Your house, your family, your spouse, those whom you love, your dreams and ambitions, even your own thoughts and your mind, even your own heart and your soul are being decided. It's being decided that this should also be offered to him. Are you sure you want to pray the prayer? Your kingdom come because it's actually a takeover. Yeah, there I said it. It's not this this nice easy flow into something where you can continue doing what you want to do and he comes along and helps it be better. No, no, no. It's a complete takeover and it doesn't have to be hostile, but it needs to be, it'll be hostile. If there's no surrender, we need to put our hands up and say, I surrender whatever your will is. And it's going to be a lot easier that way, but it's so hard when you don't understand that you've been calling yourself a believer or follower for so long Yet you're still holding on to some things that he says, no, that's mine. Give it up. So if I were to make a picture of what that looks like, it'd be like this. What's the cost? Somebody might ask. You might ask and Yeshua replies, how much you got? How much you got? That's the cost. However much you got. And it's exciting to think that everything is everything. My everything would be different than your everything. Because of who I am and where I'm at, where I'm at in life. For the rich man, it meant a whole lot of stuff. For someone else, it may mean other things. But everything is still everything. How much you got? However much you got is what I want. I got two hands. I want that. I got two feet. I want that too. I got a sound mind. I want that. I have this ability to and a talent to and a gift to. Yeah, that too. Everything. Well, what about me? Here's a question that legitimately comes up at this point when we start to realize the severity and intensity of what it looks like to go all in. Well, then who will I be? Where would I be? How would I be distinct and, and, and set apart from anybody else? He wants that, too. That desire, that ambition to want to be. And our names be up front. He says, I want that too. Because we can't compete. I like the way John the Baptist says. He says, he must become greater. I must become less. Even we see this in the armies. In just about every army I've seen, whether it's this country or another, as soon as you join that army, what do they do? You get make everyone uniform. There is no you standing out. They get their hair shaved. They get the same apparel. You walk. It's not about you. It's about the commanding officer and his instructions. Now, that's not to say that we don't have distinctions because he's given us all different gifts and abilities and parts of the body. But we must give him that desire to want to be distinct apart from someone else in our own ways. Whatever your will is, Father. I want to pursue this and do that on my own. No, according to your will, may it be done. And we see this with the rich man. I always love referencing this story. Because we see how important this one thing is when we go here and says one thing you lack in Mark 10. As Yeshua started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit internal life? Why do you call me good? Yeshua answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You should not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not give false testimony. You should not defraud. Honor your father and mother. 
Teacher, he replied. All these I've kept since I was a boy. Yeshua looked at him and he loved him. You know, I love that part. He looked at him and he loved him. And I think I always like to highlight that because what's about to come out of Yeshua's mouth doesn't sound loving. <laughs> because the way we interpret love always has to do with good feelings. Always has to do with something that happens to put a smile on our face or give us warm fuzzies. But he looked at this man and loved him and told him something that probably nobody in his life has ever told him. He's told him one thing you lack. He told this man, you are lacking. And all that you've done since you were a boy, you're still lacking. And your desire for eternal life, you're lacking. Wow. After keeping all the commandments, there it is possible that one can still be lacking? Wow. Yeah, I did that. I did that. He says, no, you don't get it. The one thing you're lacking is everything. He says, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. Why? He went away sad because he had great wealth. He had great wealth. It was too much. Here is a man who looked like in every uh, sense of the way. If we were to meet him, this is a good guy. I mean, this is a good guy. I mean, he has kept himself from all types of sin, sexual immorality, addictions, gambling, smoking, cussing. He comes to church, synagogue every week, whatever it was. I mean, this is a good guy. And within moments, Yeshua was able to say to him, you're lacking. You're still lacking. Why? Because discipleship and following Yeshua is not about doing a whole lot. It's not about doing the most. It's about complete surrender. And he's able to look at all the things we push in front of him to endear ourselves and talk about all the things we've done. He can look past all that and see, what about that? What about that? If Yeshua were to come to you, and you had the same question. Would there be a one thing he points to? I, I see that. I see that what you're doing. I see it. I see that. But one thing you lack. Is there one thing that he would say you lack? Is there one thing that you're gripping a hold of? It may be something physical that you can't. I, the idea of losing. I can't. I don't want to lose my car. I have to walk and take the bus. I don't want to lose my house and be homeless. Well, you sure? I was homeless. I don't want to lose those who are close to me. This is my best friend, my mom, my dad. I don't want our relationship to go awry. Whatever it is, it may be a pursuit, as we mentioned before, of a career or a job or a certain lifestyle. What if you can't have the lifestyle that you want? See, a lot of people think that you can have that lifestyle you want and still do God's work. Not necessarily. He may have called you some, somewhere else and to do something differently. It may work out. Who knows? The point is, are you surrendered to it? Here's a rich man who knew what his life was like up to this point and what it would be because it had been planned out. But now you're telling me to sell everything and follow you. Everything I trusted in, put my confidence and in, in, in security in and follow you. And I don't know where you're going. Exactly. I don't know where you're going to lay your head. Exactly. That's the type of surrender I want you to come to. Are we at that place? If we're truly going to claim to be his Christians, his followers, his disciples, his all in ones. It's going to be important that we surrender everything. And this is not a one time process, right? A lot of a lot of us tend to a lot of believers tend to hang their hats on a moment in the past, a moment in time that said, I made a decision, a declaration to follow God or I was baptized when and I decided and I changed my life as if what happened in that past is determining what's happening in their present. And that may have been all good and great then. The question is, is are you doing it today? You see, are you giving up everything is a daily question. Will I do it today too? You know, we learned in the last lesson that he says, take up your cross daily. Well, I did it yesterday. I did it 360 days. He said, it's a daily pursuit all over again. You do not get to ride the waves of last year's redemption of last year's baptism. It's a daily bread. It's a daily walk. Don't be deceived. We must be sure that we're going all in every day. 
we see the same sentiment as I've alluded to in Matthew 22, when an expert of law tests him with this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Yeshua replied, love Yahweh your God with all your heart, all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself and the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. How much of your heart does he want? He wants it all. Every last bit of it. I don't know if we understand the the gravity and the magnitude of this all thing. You know, I've allowed I've seen my heart desire other pursuits and other things. He says, I want all of it. I'm a jealous God. I want all of your heart. Your delight should be in me. All your soul, all your mind. I mean, just everything about who we are. And it's such a affront in the face of what we see as contemporary Christianity that gets to pick and choose, that gets to go 80 and 80 20. I do 80% of me and 20% of God, or some kind of percentage split where I'm doing my own thing and then I give God a shout out when it's time. Or I go feed the homeless, or I go do. He says, No, it's all in. All your talents and all your time and all is for me. It's not that you can't do any job, but you're completely absorbed in him and not trying to make it something on the side. The truth is we're really good at giving some. Really good at giving some, especially out of guilty conscience. We're really good at giving more than more than other people so we can feel better about ourselves and more than we've done yesterday. And we're really we can be really good at. Oh, and, and okay with giving most. Okay, I give him most of my time, most of my heart, most of my um, soul, most of my life. But all is just too much. This is where many have drawn a line and decided clearly, I'm not following God. It's too much. All is too much. All is everything. That's too, I'm not going to pay everything for that. It's too much. Not realizing that this is an investment to something so much greater. It only looks like a cost. I'm losing something. I don't get to choose. I don't get to. No, no, no. I don't want to submit. I don't want to submit to God and his plan. I don't want to submit to any other person that he called me to submit. I don't want to turn the other cheek. I don't want to endure any suffering. That cost is too great. I'll take some. I'll take more. I'll take most. Not realizing that all those others are good as nothing. You might as well not have done it. That's why he said those who say, Lord, Lord, won't make it. See, we like to create levels of Christianity. That will accompany our varying levels of commitment. They say, well, it's OK to be here. It's OK to be there. You know, you, you, you may have said it or I've definitely heard many say that I'm not that kind of Christian. You know, I'm not really all there. And you, there's, you can only go all in. You can't say, well, I'm, I'm kind of I'm, either you're all in or you're not. Now, our faith may be expressed differently in how we walk that out. But you have to get to a place where you've decided and you've surrendered everything to you everything to you. I'm not going to intentionally walk in a way less than that. This type of Christianity and this type of discipleship exists to prevent Yeshua from disrupting and interrupting our life too much. Why? I already got something going on. I don't want to be interrupted. That's why the last piece is looking at this cost of disruption. Disruption. Interruption. We hate him. I don't, I don't think I've ever met, in, met anyone who loves to be disrupted or love to be interrupted. We have a thought that we're trying to get to when someone starts talking or there's an interruption and we can't finish it. I have a seven year old amongst her other four, three siblings, sisters, and everyone's talking. And boy, she gets upset when she's like, every time I start talking, someone else has something to say. And when you're in the group of four girls wanting to get the attention of their daddy, sometimes they can feel like that. So I have to stop everybody and let her talk or she's crying and, and, and complaining, saying, I keep getting interrupted. When we're in traffic, we don't want to be slowed down or interrupted or slowed down. Why? Because by definition, it gets in our way. The disruption is to interrupt an event, activity, or process by causing a disturbance. A disturbance. Who wants a disturbance? <laughs> or a problem. The, uh, the next is interruption. It stops the continuous progress of something. An activity or a project, it stops the, wow, just reading those words can cause anxiety and tension. It stops my continuous progress. I was on my way and you came and stopped me. You came and messed me up. Well, you want to get some people upset. Whether it be physical progress 
or you're making emotional progress, mental progress, or you have an idea, anything that you see it, you, you love the momentum and it stops. It's diluted. It's delayed. It's deterred. It's upsetting. And we don't want it. And many have made the statement in light of this, that I will follow Yeshua, but he keeps getting in my way. I mean, I'm serious. I, I will completely follow him, but he keeps getting in my way. And we would never say those words oftentimes, but that's exactly what we're communicating when we decide it's too much. You're in my way. I have a plan for my life. I have a plan for my family. I have a plan for what this is supposed to look like. And your plan doesn't look like my plan. You are disrupting and interrupting my path. And I'm sharing this because the cost of following him is, is understanding that disruption is a part of the discipleship. He will not wait until a time when it's convenient for you. You're in a kingdom, not a democracy. Did you want to check my schedule? No, I'm not going to check your schedule and see when it's a good time. Matter of fact, when would be a good time? We're always busy, right? I very rarely meet anyone who says, I just, I'm just not busy. We don't have a time or an hour. We're just sitting for Yeshua to say, okay, now's a good time to come. But we're busy. We got things we're doing. We see this with the disciples where they, he interrupts and disrupts their life when calling them to follow him. He says, as Yeshua walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Yeshua said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Simon and his brother were actively casting a net into the like literally in the middle of their job. They were fishermen. They were doing a job. And Yeshua, with his inconsiderate self, is how it would feel, right? Inconsiderate, says, come follow me. Come follow me. Right now, we're having a good catch. This is a good day. We're in the middle. Can't you see how inconsiderate? God would never do that. He would never just be so uh, brazen as to interrupt right in the middle of me doing something. Or would he? We have to understand he is a king who is calling his servants to follow. He's calling his servants to submit. His matters are more important than any of ours. So if you've ever felt disrupted or interrupted by a call of God to go do something, to whether it be to follow him right now, to surrender right now, to go and share right now, whatever it is, it's an interruption. This is not convenient. This is more of a problem. I'm not going to be able to finish this on time. I had this plan. I was driving. And I saw someone I need to help. And he, and he nudged me. I need to. I, I can't because of I got to get to where I'm going. Or, you know, for me, I'm doing all these lessons. He interrupts and says, I want you to do a lesson on this and study. I'm like, but I'm almost done with whatever. It could be endless things. But Yeshua, as you see, has no problem interrupting what we're doing. We see it again in Mark 1, 19. He's When he had gone a little farther, he said he saw James, and son of Zebedee, and his brother John in their boat preparing their nets. They were busy preparing their nets. And without delay, he called them. Without hesitation, without waiting, he decided, I'm going to call you guys to come follow me right now. You see, we're getting our nets ready. Oh, my goodness. Take a breath. And that's what we're going to have to do sometimes. Take a breath and be reminded. Praise be to God. His kingdom is more important. I said I'm going all in. And that's number one. Sometimes I believe we've confused our jobs for our work. We've confused our jobs for our work. We can't conflate those two and think that they're the same. You know, this is my job. No, your, your real work. When he put Adam here, he, he put him to work. He had work for him to do. Now, he may do other jobs and help people and do things, but there was work for him to do. The master is calling you to do your work. Most people have been born and died, never fully doing the work that they're, they were called to do. For each one of us has been given a work according to his kingdom to complete. But we get caught up in following careers, following ambitions, following a certain type of life. I want to help my kids. I got to make this much money. I want to live off the grid. I want to eat like this, I want, whatever. 
we get and we want to accomplish those goals. But he says, what about the work I put you to here to do? For some, it may be going and preaching the, and putting this together. This is a big part of what I feel called to do. For some, it may be traveling to other countries and sharing. To others, it may be helping the homeless or using their voice to help people, using the skills of their hands. To, I don't know. We're serving in different ways, but we can't be at loss for what his work is for us. Are we in tune to that? What's the work that he put us here? Ephesians 4 says he's given some to be teachers and apostles and prophets and evangelists. Why? Because they have work to do. What's the work you're here to do? Just to go through life and being a quote unquote good person? No, the specific assignment that he's given us. But he calls them right in the middle of it. Disrupting them. In numbers, we see the same thing with the cloud, right? You remember the cloud in, in, the, in the desert for 40 years? It would tell them where to go. And this is how it went. It says, whenever the, in Numbers 9, and whenever the cloud lifted from over the tent, after that, the people of Israel set out. When did they set out? After the cloud lifted. And in, and in the place where the cloud settled down, they're the people of Israel count. See how simple that is? Now, w- did this take into account what that person had going on at the time? Oh, man. It just left it. You know, I just got settled. You know, I just put that last peg in. You know, I just set up my kitchen and got this horse. They're about to have a baby. And this. So, nope. The cloud moved and they moved. The cloud settled and they settled. It literally says at the command of Yahweh, the people of Israel set out and at the command of Yahweh, they count. As long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in the count. This is the expectation. He, he this is the the is what he expects of those who follow him not to be put in forth is that I can't or I won't or it's inconvenient. No, this is what I called you to do. This is what we must do. It's time to move. Furthermore, it says, and even the, even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle, many days, it may have been an uncomfortable place, but if it were there many days, the people kept the charge of Yahweh and did not sit out. I don't like being here. I want to tap out. This is hard. This place is uncomfortable. There's no water. It's hot. It's cold. It's whatever the case is. There's people here. I don't like my neighbors. I don't like this job. I don't like this relationship. I don't like this this season of my life. I want to. I got it. I got it. He says, no, I have not moved yet. So they didn't set out. This is what it's like to be in the kingdom. Your kingdom come. Not your kingdom. His kingdom come. And when his kingdom comes. We settle when he settles and we lift and go when he lifts and go. The people kept the charge of Yahweh and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was a few days over the tabernacle. And according to the command of Yahweh, they remain in the camp. Then according to the command of Yahweh, they set out. Sometimes it was. Sometimes it wasn't. There was no Google, Google calendar that they passed around that says here is the agenda over the next few weeks, months and years, which you can expect. So be prepared. You simply had to look up every day and see, is it time? Sometimes it was a few days and it may have taken, taken them a few days just to get set up properly. You got the, I mean, you have a whole house of things, a whole livestock. You got animals, you got kids, you got a small community, just your family alone. And just to get things set up and right and, and get going. Because you still got to eat and prepare your food throughout this process. Now it's time to go. I just I just know that there was some serious grumbling when we just got here and no reason is given. This is another huge point. No reason is given for why we're leaving. At least give me a reason. Say we have some enemies on the way. Say we ran out of water. Tell me something. No, the cloud lifts. The cloud will lift in your life and say it's time to go. There's a disruption. This is what discipleship looks like. It is not about putting Yeshua in your pocket and on your a picture on your wall or a Bible on the shelf that says, I have him there when I need him. When I need help, I'll come. No, no, no. It's all surrender. Wherever you want to go, I'll go. I don't know where it's going to take me. Abraham went not knowing where it would take him and how to get there and what to expect. Only that, only that Yahweh said to go. Sometimes the cloud remained from evening until morning, barely one day. And when the cloud lifted in the morning, they set off. Or if it continued for a day and night, when the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether it was two days or a month or a long time that the cloud continued over the tabernacle, abiding there, the people remained 
in the camp and did not set out. But when they lifted, they set out. This is the simplicity of discipleship. We should keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Well, how do we know about the cloud now we can't see it? This is why it's important to spend the time in prayer and Bible study and meditation. Where is he calling me now? You know, where is he calling me now? The uh, Bible won't always tell you what you need to do today, what you need to do today. Just like for the rich man, there was no verse in there that told him he needed to go sell everything and get. No, he needed to understand it was everything, whatever that meant for him. For someone else, it meant something different. What is he saying to you? Either way, they were resolved to do exactly what he said. I'm convinced that some who are watching this and need to watch this and many, many who call themselves the followers of God have stayed in the camp that God left a long time ago. And they're no longer following Yeshua. They're no longer following Yahweh, but still calling themselves followers of Yahweh. But they stay because they've decided that, one, I'm afraid of where it's going and I don't know what to expect. I know what to expect here and I'd rather stay here. Thank you. I'm comfortable. I stay here because I I like it here. It's been prosperous here. I don't want to go to a worse. You're taking us to a worse region. I don't want to go. And it goes off. But yet we still maintain the label. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower. Yeshua says, no, you must count the cost to be a disciple. It costs everything. So if we're going to continue to claim to follow him, we cannot say I follow him. Again, I say, say, I believe that he exists. Say, I believe that he died and he rose on the third day for our sins. But do not say I'm a Christian because I'm not following. Do not say you're a disciple. Do not say you're a follower because you're not following. If you're not willing to pack up and move when he says it's time to pack up and move. And we give all the justifications and the reasons, don't we, for why we can't and why we won't. And it makes sense. We draw out our mental piece of paper about the cost and benefits and say, well, this is not going to work well. That's going to hurt some people. This is going to upset somebody. This is not going to make me as much money. Surely God doesn't want all those things to come to me. And I say, have you not read the scriptures? Are you the only one who has had to go through something that was tough? And he says, yes, this is exactly how it's going to be. Go back and look at the last study about what it costs to take up your cross, to deny yourself. He says, I didn't hide any of these for you. Too many times we conclude that God doesn't want us to be in pain. So since God doesn't want me to be in pain, that's not his will. And we stay in the camp when he says, nope, get your get your bones up. I know those legs are tired, but it's time to move. I know we're about to go somewhere else, but it's time to go. At the command of Yahweh, they counted. At the command of the Yahweh, they set out. They kept the charge of Yahweh at the command of Yahweh by Moses. They kept the command. This is discipleship. They're following. Now, even with all that said, this was an easier following because they physically followed him. But he wants our hearts. You see, I've learned there's a difference between obeying God and submitting to him. Obeying God simply means I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to pack my tent up and I'll go here. But on the inside, I'm not surrendered. I'm not happy. I'm not trusting. I'm not surrendered to say whatever and whenever. I'm still unresolved and not at peace with you. Now, see, this is, the, this is actually, even hard as that is, the physical part, the mental and the emotional and the spiritual surrender, and that submission, is that I'm going to do it and I'm out with you 120%. And no matter what you say, in the future, I'll do because I'm submitted to wherever you want to take me. So what should be our response? We go back to when they were called the disciples. Here's our response. As Yeshua walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a nade into the, into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Yeshua said, and I will send, out, send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. At once. They left their nets at once. Don't you need to stop and think? No, no, you don't know who's calling us. He's the king. I'm being called by the. What you mean? I'm. Let me figure this out. If I have to stop and do all these calculations, then I'm the king, and I decide, you know, whether or not. No, no, no. He's calling me. I have to trust he's made provisions. I was gonna feed this to my family. I was gonna sell this to make the money to feed them. You know, I have. Yes, he knows. He's the king. And don't forget that uh, these are fishermen who are being called by a rabbi. If you know the context and the history, 
fishermen didn't get a chance to be disciples of these these smart rabbi type people. So they're excited, like, you know, what? I'm just a fisherman. What a great opportunity. And, you know, think of what you were when you were called. It's like, I wasn't that great. And now the son of God is calling me a great rabbi. Oh, my goodness. I'm gone. I'm not going to keep doing what I've been doing. Again, and when he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat preparing the nest. Without delay, he called them and they left their father Zebedee in a boat with the hired men and they follow him. What do they know that we don't? That they are dropping everything and saying, I got to go. And as I mentioned before, it likely has something to do with the fact that they understood they were fishermen. They didn't make the cut. See, if you had gone through the school of learning Hebrew, of learning the word of God and all this, and you did so well, the story has it that you got to go on to be one of the followers of some of these rabbis and such. But if you didn't, you took on the profession of your father. And now a rabbi's calling me, even though I've quote unquote failed the test. Wow. He's our king. They left their father Zebedee in the boat without delay after when he called them without delay. Even your father left behind. We have to have this attitude. The attitude we should not have is as follows. As we were walking on the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. You should reply, foxes have dens and birds of the ha birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. He says, be careful. See, I love you. Yeshua tells us up front, I don't even know where I'm sleeping. I want to follow you. Some people get excited. I want to follow you. Count the cost. Have you counted the cost of what that means? Many people have not. They see everyone hands up in church and they hear about all the good things. But he says, biblically speaking, here's the truth. Not just what your community or church or uh, the, the channels you're subscribed to on social media. The truth is this. It's going to be uncomfortable. Did they tell you that? It's going to be pain. Did they tell you that? There's going to be a lot of unknowns. Well, you're just going to have to trust me from one day to another. Did they explain that to you? So don't be so excited. See, Yeshua is not so enthralled and wrapped up in the fact that, oh, they want to follow me. Great. As we are today, right? You know, I want to get likes and subscribers and build the church and get all these numbers. He wasn't moved by that. He says, before you say, yeah, most people would say, yeah, great. Come on. If whatever you saw was good, just let's come along. Let's build the numbers. He says, no, no, no. First thing I'm going to tell you is it's really tough. Well, pastor, if that was a pastor, you're like, pastor, you're not helping the church grow. If she was not interested in building numbers. He's interested in true worshipers following him. He wants you and I to be true worshipers. He's not trying to get everybody and get a whole lot of people. If you have 15, great. If you have 100, great. He says, I just want the, the faithful, the true ones. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first, let me go and bury my father. Yeshua said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. See, the problem is when called, we always have something to say. Well, first, let me, first, let me, have you ever said that? Whether to a person, you know, growing up as a kid, dad could say something. Well, first, let me, no, 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 this is what I'm asking you to do. First, let me. See, first has to be his kingdom and the king is calling you. So he says, no, no, no. Let the dead brother own that. I got to go take care of some business first because it's important. Don't you know I understand the business? But this is greater business. My family? You know, we talked about this last time. Those close to me? You know my father's at the end of his life. Come follow me. You're not fit. And go, and go proclaim the kingdom of God, he says. Still another man. I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back. Here we go. First... Let me go back mm -mm, and say goodbye to my family. See, both of these entail family, familiar relationships. This is my father. This is my family. You sure apply no one, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Are we starting to get the picture now that it's going to require us going all in and it's going to require times that feel painful and discomfort and won't make sense. But he says, if I'm calling you, I need you to come. How am I going to pay that bill? How is this going to work out with their attitudes? This is not, we started doing the calculations and he says, come. But my father, my mother, my family, 
come. Follow me. This requires full trust that he has something better for us in mind, for this life and especially for the life to come. Like he said to the rich man, he said, you'll have treasure in heaven. But I'm not going to, I have to, that's a big uh, sacrifice. That's a big risk of not, I have to wait to see. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a huge treasure in heaven. Do you really believe it? You're going to go all in, completely all in. All right. So that's, let's recap. So we looked at Christian is the same as disciple in our first study. And that was important because that's the word that we're following here. And that's used oftentimes. According to Yeshua, no one can be a disciple unless they give how much? Everything. Make sure there is nothing that you're holding back when it comes to your time, your money, your things, your relationships. And I'm emphasizing your because it's really not yours. If you're identifying someone as as someone who's in the kingdom of God, it's not yours. He makes it clear to us. And I'll share this in another study. But we're stewards, right? We're stewards of the things he entrusted to us. Even the bodies that we have, they're called tents because that's where our spirit and our soul resides. But they're going to be taken away. They rot. They die. Everything we're being stewards of in his kingdom because we're serving a king who comes back and demands a return on what he invested in us. Everything he wants. And he rightfully should because we're saying that he's our king. Disruption and interruption are a part of following Yeshua. Don't be upset. Don't be angry. When, not if, but when you are interrupted, when you are disrupted, when your path, whenever, especially when it's not in path to what he wants. What looks like a disruption to us is actually part of God's plan. It's exactly the way it's supposed to be. But sometimes we're so quick and so determined to get back on track to where we were going that we've run away from the call. And we should just surrender and say, that's the way it's got to be. It's not what I planned. Not what I had in mind, but that's what God's plan. And then lastly, to you, she was called to follow him. We should respond at once and with immediacy, full trust. This is what he wants us to do. Let us not be deceived, brothers and sisters and friends, that the call to be a disciple requires everything, that we have to take the time to actually count that cost. This is not something we can get caught up in with what's going on with contemporary Christianity. And the simple fact that I show up to church, read my Bible, or believe that there's a God and that Yeshua died for our sins is not enough. And I know that's going to be hard to hear for some. Like, no, no, no. You're making, you're adding more things. And that's why I want to be clear in sharing all these scriptures. This is Yeshua's word. He says, you cannot. You cannot be my disciple. You haven't even counted the cost. I want to follow you. It's not that simple. You don't get to just say, I'm a Christian. You can say it. But that doesn't make it true. You can dress like it, but it doesn't make it real. Real believers are those who give me everything, who counted the cost and says, I know you don't have a place to lay your head. I know it's going to mean pain and suffering. I know it's going to mean interruption and disruption, but I'm all in. I know it's going to mean me surrendering the life that I wanted. I may get some of it. I may get it all. But either way, I'm surrendered to what you want. Glory be to God. Let us not be deceived. Share this with friends, with families, with whomever is seeking to enter into the kingdom of God, that they may also be be not deceived about what is required to be a true follower, true Christian, so that none of us are weeping and gnashing our teeth on that last day. May God bless you and keep you. Thanks for tuning in again. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. And I will see you next lesson.